Well, hello and welcome again to our online Bible study. Our theme is your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This We're taking this theme from what Jesus taught us in the Lord's Prayer that the primary purpose of us is to bring the kingdom of God into reality here on this earth. In Psalm chapter 8, it tells us that he has given us dominion of the works of his hands. He has put all things under our feet. He has given us dominion of this earth. But what he wants is for us to operate earth just as it is in heaven. So justice, righteousness, holiness, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's our role, that's our position. But this is our domain. <clears throat> this is our king. Well, we should be promoting the kingdom of God and how God operates, how the kingdom of God operates here upon this earth. Now, today we're going to be looking at a pillar and buttress of truth. And our scripture is coming from 1 Timothy chapter 3 verses 14 through 16. This is Paul writing to Timothy who is a younger man who has become one of Paul's most faithful and loyal uh, helper or supporter or teammate if you will. And so he's encouraging this younger man. And so he says, I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Now, the Apostle Paul in this was talking about the church of the living God. And the Greek word for church, quote unquote, is ekklesia. Ekklesia. In the ancient Greek language, church or ekklesia, it was really a non-religious word. It was a word that was used in the secular world. But what it meant was a group of people that were called together for a purpose. Or if you will, it was an assembly of people. It was people that were called together for a specific purpose. And in other words, in this case, the living God calls his people together for his purpose. So the living God is calling the ecclesia, the church, the body of Christ, together for his purpose. Now, there's no clear circumstance of church or instance of church being used as a place of meeting or of worship. So what I'm talking about is a building. You didn't refer to a building as a church. It wasn't being used for a place or a meeting place of worship. It's not a building. But after the time of the apostles, well, that's where it began to receive that meaning. And then now in our culture, when we think church, we think of a building but that's not what the early intention of that word, ecclesia, it meant a, a people that were assembling together for a specific purpose. And you don't have to be in a quote, unquote, what we call church building, a, a certain place that 
church, that ecclesia, could be in a home. Paul, when he was in Philippi, he went down by the riverbank because there were some, a group of people that had met there to pray. And so he went to the riverbank. Jesus went to the seashores. He went into the villages. He went into the hillsides. I mean, he, he went, and it wasn't just a building. He had church or ecclesia wherever he went. If it was in a boat, if it was on the seashore, if it was on in the villages, if it was in a synagogue, wherever there was a place where people were assembled together for a specific purpose, and that was to learn more about the Lord and to worship Him. But, you know, you go fast forward to maybe in the 300s, AD, and you get the Roman Catholic, you get Constance, Constantine, who um, really does not separate between church and state. And so you have the government involved in worship and determining how things are going to be operated. You get the Roman Catholic Church that begins. And as an outgrowth of that, you get these cathedrals, these very elaborate structures. But that's not what the Lord wants us to do, I mean, or to be, or to have, necessarily. You look in Europe today, there are great cathedrals that are scattered throughout the different countries in Europe. But what are they today? They're more or less mausoleums. They're, they're museums. They're beautiful structures. They're gorgeous. But there's no people. There's very little, you know, there may be a, a small number of people that are involved, but there's not the people that are assembled there. It's a great building. You go to Charleston, South Carolina, and there's churches everywhere. Beautiful and architecturally beautiful buildings and historic buildings, but are they being utilized for their purpose? You know, that it should be an assembly place where people gather to worship and study and pray. It doesn't have to be a, you know, a building, and we've tried to emphasize that. So a church is not a, an ecclesia. The word in the Greek is ecclesia. I hate to use the word church because in our mind, we think of a building. But it's not a building. It's not necessarily a specific place. Just think about this. The Hebrew people had a temple. In the Old Testament, we have Solomon. David wanted to build a temple for the Lord. But God would not allow him, but he allowed his son Solomon. And Solomon worked seven years or had, it was the construction took seven years to build that temple. It was gorgeous. It was magnificent. But that structure, that building was destroyed by the Babylonians, we'll say some 500 years later. And so it was completely demolished. Well, the Jews ended up into captivity and say a hundred years later, they began rebuilding that structure, that temple. And then by the time you get to Jesus' time, you get a pagan king, Herod, who spends decades to enhance and glorify the second temple. But what happens in 70 AD? The Romans come along and destroy that temple. So the Jews had two temples, two places where they were worshiping and assembling as 
a whole nation, especially at their feast times, or the divine appointments of the Lord, Passover, Pentecost, tabernacles, etc. But those two temples, even though they were magnificent structures, they were demolished, completely demolished. Jesus told his disciples, he said, you know, they were looking at the temple, they were overlooking Jerusalem, and they were just, you know, they were in awe of the magnificent structure of the temple. And Jesus said, you look at this building, not one stone will be left upon another. And for 2,000 years, from, the, from 70 AD until the early 1900s, and even up to today, there has not been a temple in Jerusalem. It's not there. And this was the focal point of their worship system. But they've been without a temple all that time. So what have they done? The Jews were scattered throughout the world into all the nations of the world and did not begin to return to their homeland until the early 1900s or the late 1800s and didn't become a nation again at, from 70 AD until 1948. They didn't have a quote-unquote building, a temple, a specific place. But that didn't mean that the church, the ecclesia, didn't exist. Because the ecclesia is not a building. It's a body of believers who are united in belief and purpose. And as Paul is saying in our text, as a pillar and buttress or reinforcement of the truth. So it's a body of believers who are united in belief and purpose. That's what ecclesia or church is. In 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You're not your own. For you, have, you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. So Paul is saying, you know, and Paul is saying you don't have to have a temple to worship. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. If you're born again, the Holy Spirit has deposited a layer of himself inside of you, and now you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells inside of you. Just like in Solomon's, when he dedicated the temple, the first temple, it said that the glory of the Lord filled that temple and they couldn't even stand up because the glory of God was there. But now the glory of God should be living and dwelling in each one of us who are born again believers. We are the temple. We are the ecclesia, the body of believers. And we're to be a pillar and buttress of the truth. And as such, Paul is admonishing believers to do the following. Listen to this, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 18. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Now the church at Corinth had a you know had a problem had an issue with this uh, sexual immorality. There was a man in there that was having an affair with um, you know a family member. So that was not a good situation. So Paul was addressing this, and he says, "Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin that a person commits is outside the body, but when you." Uh, commit a sexual sin that's against your own body 
And if your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, you're defiling the temple. So, getting back to Timothy, if we go back to uh, 1 Timothy, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, here is what Paul said and what he was teaching Timothy. He says, now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. The law has a purpose. People say, well, we're not living in, under law. Well, let's think about this. Verse 9, understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers. Now let me just pick on, the, you know, emphasize this. The law is not for the just. The law is not for those who are living and keeping the Holy Spirit alive inside of them, of keeping in step, I think is the way the scripture says, keeping in step with the Spirit. If the Holy Spirit is has produced fruit in us, like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, if the Holy Spirit is living and abiding in us, then the law is not for us because we have a law that supersedes that. I mean, it's a law of our hearts. We don't have to have something externally telling us, well, you need to do this or this or this, because internally we have the Holy Spirit who's living inside of us. So what is the purpose of the law? It's for those who are disobedient, who are ungodly, who are profane, who are unholy, who are not living according to the word of God, to those who are rebellious, to those who are unrepentant. Okay? Verse 10, he goes on, this sexually immoral. Let's, let's get it back in context. The law is for... And he continues, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. That's what the law is for. For those who are unrepentant, for those who are disobedient, for those who are practicing immorality, ungodliness. Okay, verse 11, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. The gospel of the glory is that God has set us free from the law of sin and death. If we have given our lives to the Lord, if we are born again, if the Holy Spirit lives inside of us, now, this gets back to what we've been talking about before, about law versus grace. Here's the bottom line. An unrepentant sinner, and that, that includes someone who calls themselves a Christian, but they're unrepentant and they're not living a life of godliness, who chooses to live in a lifestyle of sin, just as we, as Paul mentioned some of the things that an unrepentant sinner would do, who chooses to live a lifestyle of sin is not under grace, but are under the law with its penalty of death. If a person is living in sin, they're still under the law with its penalty of death. If we're, of course, you know, people can sin, like David, but he repented, and he never committed that sin again. He was truly, he bore fruit that he was truly repentant. 
He didn't continue in that lifestyle. He married the one <coughs> that he had impregnated out of wedlock. He married her. He took care of her for the rest of his life. So he didn't continue and he didn't do this sin again. So he was repentant. So, but if he had continued in that lifestyle, he would not be under grace. There would be no mercy. He would be under the penalty of death. Look at Romans chapter 6. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, see the difference? You've been set free from the sin, from ungodliness, from unrighteousness. Now you become slaves of God. The fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end is eternal life. Now, verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God, that's grace, is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You look at the woman that was caught in adultery that was brought to Jesus. She was caught in the very act, it said. Now, how the men who brought her there knew this and were, you know, who was the eyewitness of this? What were they doing? I don't know. But they brought this woman to Jesus and said she was caught in the very act of adultery. Of course, they didn't bring the man. Both of them were guilty. But the wages of sin is death. So the people said, what, you know, the law says that she should be stoned. What do you say? And then Jesus starts writing on the ground and he says, those that are without sin, throw the first stone. I don't know what he was writing on the ground, but maybe he was saying, okay, George, this is what you did. Or Sam, this is what happened, you know, what you've been messing around with. I don't know. Maybe he was revealing their sins. I don't know. It doesn't say what he wrote on the ground. But little by little, they dropped their rocks and left. And Jesus said, we're your accusers. And she said, well, they're gone. And he says, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. That's the free grift. Uh, gift of grace is that you're guilty of sin, I mean of death you're guilty of, of sin and that would bring death but if you go and sin no more here's grace here is grace go live not under the, don't be a slave to sin be set free from your sin and you'll have eternal life. You see what I'm saying? The wages of sin is death. She deserved to die, just like we all do. But the free gift, called grace, leads to eternal life. But if we continue in those sins, there is no forgiveness. There is no grace. We're not to tolerate a person's sin... Jesus didn't tolerate this woman's sin when she was caught in adultery. He let her know that it was not right. But at the same time, he allowed her to receive eternal life by giving her a second chance. So we're not to tolerate a person's sin or say, oh, it's okay, go ahead, you know, God loves everybody, and he understands what you're going through. No. God doesn't tolerate sin. He will not allow sin into heaven. We're not to allow a person's sin in the body of Christ. The church at Corinth, there was a man there committing gross sin. He said, even the Gentiles don't even do what this man is doing. 
And he says, you need to deal with this person. You need to put them out of the, of the congregation. But then later he says, now if he repents, accept him back in. If, you know, but we're to offer an unrepentant sinner the message of grace and the opportunity to be reconciled to God. That yes, you have sinned and you deserve death. But if you repent of your sins, you have an opportunity to be reconciled to God. Go and sin no more. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 19 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. We're a new creature. We're not the same person. There's been a lot of people that have been involved in a lot of sin and sex and drugs and alcohol and crime and murder and all these things. You know, Moses was a murderer. David was a murderer, an adulterer. All these things, but they were extended grace because they repented of their sins. Verse 18, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. John 3, 17, for, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. They were living in condemnation because of their sins, but God didn't send Jesus into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That there could be reconciliation. For those who repent, repentance is the key. It's not just saying, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. It's turning away from that lifestyle. It's divorcing yourself from the things that have caused division between you and God because God is holy and we must be holy. Now, let's get back to where our text where it talked about that we are a pillar. What is a pillar? Well, here's how it's defined. It's an upright shaft or structure. It can be made of stone, brick, or other material. It's relatively slender in proportion to how high it is, how tall it is. And it's of any shape, but it's used as a building support. Or if it's standing along, it's used as a monument. But if it's a building, it was to keep a building from falling. A pillar was there to keep a building from falling. Remember Samson? He was blinded by the Philistines. And they brought him into the temple because they just wanted to make fun of him. And they were having a, a celebration. The Philistines were. And Samson told the one that was take, you know, that was uh, guarding him. He said, just put me against the pillar. And he prayed and he said, Lord, just let me die with the Philistines. And he pushed those pillars down. And the building fell on top of the Philistines and killed them. So a pillar is there to keep a building from falling down. So the Apostle Paul wrote that the Ecclesia, Ecclesia, however you want to pronounce it, some people pronounce it differently, Ecclesia, is the pillar of the truth. It's what holds up who we are. As a people of God. 
we're, and he says we're the pillar of the truth. If we don't defend the truth, which is in the word of God, the structure or the building will collapse. And that's what's happening in our world today. There are churches or denominations that are crumbling. Why? Because we've compromised the truth. And we've allowed false doctrines to slowly eat away at us to eventually destroy our message and our purpose. We have compromised the word of God. We're saying, oh, it's okay. We know you can't help being what you, you are. Circumstances in your life, well, we're so sorry, and we're supposed to love you. Well, love expresses itself in truth. Truth. We need, to, you know, we're to speak the truth in love. In love. If we don't tell people the truth, we don't really love them because we're allowing that person to die and go to hell because they don't know any better. We are the defenders of the truth. We are the pillar and buttress, the buttress, the support of the ecclesia. And it's the truth that will set us free. This is what will set us free from sin and death, is the truth. The truth will set us free. And we are to defend the truth. It may be a hard message to proclaim. When you confront people with their sin, they don't like it. But we don't love them if we don't. And that's the reason that the church has become weak and ineffective and does not have an impact on our society the way it once did. It's because we compromise the truth. Because, you know, just like Jesus, he didn't condone the woman that was called in adultery. He didn't condone her sin. But he didn't condemn her either. He gave her an opportunity to repent and to change and to get her life back on course. And we are ministers of reconciliation. We are here to try to help people get back, get their lives back on course. But if we in, uh, enable them and say, it's okay to do what you're doing and we'll even make you the leaders of our churches this is wrong. You've just weakened the, the very pillar of the church when you do that, the ecclesia, when you do that, when you compromise the truth. The truth will set us free. So we'll end this message with this hymn, How Firm a Foundation. This is what it's talking about, the foundation of the ecclesia. What is our foundation? It's the truth. The truth that will set us free. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. There's no other way. Not good works. Nothing that we can do. No sacrifices that we can make. Jesus is the only sacrifice. His shed blood is what makes atonement for our sins. There's nothing but the blood of Jesus that can make us whole again. Nothing. Nothing. Some people say, well, I'll come to Jesus when I get my life straightened out. No, you won't. And that's not what it's about. What it is is that we have to say, Jesus, you're my only hope. I can't do it by myself. We can't straighten our lives out. We try, but we can. It's only, the only hope we have is to be born again. Jesus said, you must be born again if you want to enter into the kingdom of heaven. You have to allow the Holy Spirit into your heart.
And the whole, notice the word Holy Spirit. There's nothing unclean or impure that's going to go into heaven. That's ungodly. It won't get into heaven. I'm sorry. There's a wall and there's gates that will not allow liars, will not allow the ungodly, the wicked, the evil. It will not allow those entities into heaven. Otherwise, heaven wouldn't be heaven. But here's the words to this hymn. How firm a foundation. Firm a foundation. Firm a foundation. Based on the truth. The truth that will set you free. How firm a foundation, you saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in His excellent word. Thy word is truth, right? That's the firm foundation. What more can he say than to you he has said? To you who for refuge to Jesus have fled. That's our only refuge. That's our only hope is Jesus Christ and him crucified. His death Burial, resurrection, and ascension into heaven. And the fact that he put his blood on the mercy seat. And God says, when I see the blood of my son on the mercy seat. And I see that you're covered by the blood of my son. Then I'll pass over you. That's our only hope. His son who was holy. That was righteous. There was no sin. He did not commit any sin. It was his blood that covers our sins. So we go to him. He's our refuge. Then it goes on. Fear not. I am with you. Oh, be not dismayed. For I am your God and will still give you aid. I'll strengthen you, help you, and cause you to stand Upheld by my gracious, omnipotent hand. It's not us. He says, I'll help you. I'll keep you standing. I'll uphold you with my righteous hand. Read uh, in Isaiah. Isaiah 41. He says, do not fear, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That's what the psalmist or the hymn writer is saying here. I'll strengthen you. I'll help you. That's exactly what it says in Isaiah. I'll cause you to stand. You can't stand in your own goodness, your own righteousness. All our righteousness is like filthy rags. Then it says in verse 3, When through the deep waters I call you to go, the rivers of sorrow shall not overflow. For I will be with you, your trouble to bless, and sanctify to thee your deepest distress. Again, Isaiah says, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Well, I think this was the inspiration too for what the hymn writer was saying here. The deep waters, when you're going through the deep waters, I will, I'll be with you. The rivers, they'll not overflow you. They'll not sweep you away. I'll be with you in trouble. In your deepest distress. And verse 4. When through fiery trials. The pathway shall lie. My grace. My grace. All sufficient. Shall be your supply. My grace. God's unmerited favor towards us. That will be our supply. That's what's going to take care of us. Like I said in Isaiah 43. The flame shall not harm you. 
You'll walk. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The flame shall not harm you. I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. Yeah, God wants to purify us and cleanse us of all the junk in our lives. And then, finally, the soul that on Jesus does lean for repose, I will not, I will not desert to his foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. The Lord will not forsake us. Never. Never. He won't desert us. I'll never leave you. I'll never desert you. If we'll lean on Jesus, he's our only hope. He's the foundation. He's the foundation stone. He's the cornerstone of all that we are. And we are the pillar or buttress of the faith. We have to hold the faith. We have to be the support of the ecclesia, the body of Christ. And that pillar has to be the pillar of truth, the pillar of the word of God. Thy word is truth. We have to uphold the word of God regardless of whether we're politically correct or not. Regardless of whether we'll be criticized or condemned because of what we stand for. We are to have, we are the pillar of truth. We have to to be what keeps everything from falling to pieces, from being destroyed. The ecclesia or the ecclesia, the body of Christ, we have to maintain and we have to be that pillar and buttress of the truth. Of the word of God. If we want to survive. In the world in which we live. 